we have that want to have the hard scientific evidence, but it starts in the soft science form, right? So it's like we want to take that soft observations that we're seeing and, and mold it into something that we can say is hard. And of course, when we're talking about hard scientific data, we need people to be doing these studies and whatnot. So Lori, as far as as far as that transition goes, does everything kind of start in that soft science domain and then work its way towards, because we're not going to get studies on everything. So what do we do about that? Yeah, absolutely. It starts with something that you observe in the animal and just an intuitive feeling that you have. So I see the snake pushing on the door and rubbing on the glass. Well, I think he wants out. The snake wants out. But how do I really know that? How do I know that the temperature in the enclosure just isn't too hot? Or how do I know that they just don't want the door open so that there's a fresh input of air? In order to test that, I think the snake wants out. I now have to open the door and sit back and see what happens. Mm. Does the snake come out? Does the snake sit on the threshold? Does the snake go back into the enclosure and hide? So you start with something kind of intuitive, you know, that Can I pause you for just one second there? Because the, the concept yeah. of the snake sitting on the threshold is something I've seen in my animals. And it's so weird. You see them and it looks like they want out. You open the door and then they sit there. I'm like, well, what the, what do you like? There's almost yeah. no difference between this and that. So do you have any speculation on what that is? Is it, is it fresh air or is there something more going on there? I speculate, depending on the type of enclosure you have, they may have a better view of the environment mm -hmm. from that angle than when the door is closed. But I have some that do that and are in glass enclosures. And I think that it has to do with when the doors open, they now have the choice. They can they know that they can come out if they want to. And when you close that door, they're uncomfortable because now they know they can't get out. And so that just all goes back to options and choices and offering those things. And anytime that you are offered options and choices and are free to do things because you decide to do them, you're going to have better welfare and be less distressed than if I am forcing you against your will to do something. Mm -hmm. And I can force you against your will to stay in the enclosure, or I could force you against your will to come out. And either one of th those things could be stressful. So it is important that we individualize how we treat each animal and their care. And what is stressful for one animal may not be stressful for another. And I don't see enough people in the reptile hobby trying to build resiliency in their animals. I hear a lot of never do this with your snake. It'll stress them. Well, how about teaching your snake to not be stressed by that event? Because what's it's, it's all well and good if you can keep that snake for life and no disaster ever happens in your keeping. The enclosure never gets broken. You never have to evacuate. The animal never has to be rehomed or go to the vet. All of these things that could happen. Why would you not want to prepare your animal to deal with those possibilities and cope with them in the best way possible? You know, if you only ever expose your animal to their enclosure and only ever feed them in there and only ever do these black and white things and your animal has to experience a change, it is going to be stressed. But if you build behavioral diversity in your animal and start building that resiliency and getting them used to different environments, living in different environments, eating in different environments, being handled in different ways, not all at once, not like you have to learn all this and be okay with it by tomorrow, but over the months and years that you have that animal, if you slowly desensitize them to these different things, like I have many of my snakes will eat wherever, they don't care. They'll eat in the enclosure, on top of the enclosure, out of the enclosure, it doesn't matter. Do I have a few that are outside of that realm? Yes. You're always going to have some individuals that are going to be stressed about certain things because they just have innately less resiliency than others. Um, but I think it's really important that instead of trying to shield our reptiles from these things, oh, that'll stress them, never do that, that we should be trying to build resiliency in them. So if they experience changes, they're not stressed by it. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to point out, because Mariah talked a little bit about wild-caught animals versus captive bred and raised animals, and how you care for them differently, or you might train them differently, that it's also important to realize that family animals that are going to live and be part of your family as a pet or family member, you're going to foster different behaviors in them and train them differently and care for them differently than if you're raising animals um, for conservation that are going to be re-released out into the wild. That's going to be much different. And I've had people 
who've contacted me with um, overreactive feeding responses and say, you know, how do I calm the feeding response in my animal? And you'll get somebody else that will say, why would I want to calm the feeding response? I want my animal to eat. Like, like I want them to strike at everything because I don't want them to stop eating. Well, teaching the animal to have a calm feeding response when they're going to be a family pet is a prudent thing to do. Because if that if that family pet's going to be handled by you or by children or around visitors, you don't want an animal that's going to strike at everything or try to eat everything. You want them to assess, is this food or not? Oh, I've evaluated it. It's food. Okay, I'll eat it. You want to calm the feeding response. And that may not be the case for animals that you're going to re-release in the wild, but you want to raise them very differently. And the animal's not going to stop eating because it checks first to see if something's actually food or not. I guarantee they're still going to eat, even if you calm their feeding response. Hmm. Um, and one of the, a couple of the other things that I wanted to address that TC mentioned um, was the, the amount of area that some animals traveled in the wild and how can we replicate that under captive management. And, you know, horses are a great example. They travel 20 miles a day when they're in a wild environment but yet we keep them in an acre or we keep them in a half acre paddock. And there are systems for equids out there called paddock paradises and interactive corral systems. And there's no reason why you can't take those concepts and give them to reptiles. And it's where you provide the water and the food at like two different locations or the burrowing area or the area where the animal's gonna roll in a different location from other resources. So you spread the resources out within the habitat that you do have to make them move around instead of just putting everything in one sp spot where they can just sit there and have access to it all without moving. And then Joe mentioned that you're not gonna notice an animal distressed if you don't give them UVB. And that is true if they've never had it. There was a study in 2017 about taking away enrichment and that once an animal's had something and gotten used to it and you take it away, that's worse than them never having had it in the first place. And so one of the, um, I've been doing some little studies with UVB just to watch how it changes behavior. And I have a Darwin carpet python who since he's had UVB, if that light doesn't come on, like when it's supposed to, he's up there going wild, like pacing the light and pushing on the fixture. And he's exhibiting all of this behavior that I never saw before he had access to the UVB. And as soon as the light is turned on, he gets underneath it on his perch and relaxes and stretches out. And so he does exhibit what I would term as distressful behavior when that light doesn't come on when he expects it to. But I, I never saw that behavior before he had it, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I Lori, think that, oh yeah, do, were you jumping in there, TC? Yeah, I was gonna ask, um, as far as like when we're, the, that course that you shared with us, the welfare science, they talked about um, acute stress versus chronic stress and when that transitions and then the idea of like um, not being able to basically change your environment or get away from the stressor or manipulate the stressor to relieve the stress. And right. I was thinking in the case of your Python trying to change the light, um, <laughs> <laughs> how many pythons does it take to change the light? Well, but um, <laughs> uh, the question what like, so when we're trying to assess behaviors and providing resources and things, and like, we're trying to get this, you know, answer the question at the beginning, where do, what, what would you expect to see if it goes? Because that sounds like acute stress in a, in a small a small amount of acute st distress. What would you expect to see when that animal goes to the chronic? Because we can kind of it sounds like in welfare science that in acute stress, ideally you don't want it a, much, but some is okay, especially if yes. it's like combative or competition because that can provide healthy stuff. But mm -hmm. like. When, what would be the transition? Say that light never came back on. What would you, what would be a key indicator that, okay, now we've got a problem. Yeah, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, like we've already got sense. the, that's what I'm trying to ask. Like how yeah. would a keeper look at that and then apply change? Does that make sense? So acute, acute stress for all organisms is normal. I mean, we're equipped to deal with acute stress. 
something happens unexpected or the stress response kicks in and our body's physiologically able to deal with that. The stress goes away and we go back to homeostasis. So we're all designed to deal with that and it's normal. But when stress becomes chronic, things that you'll see are reduced activity. You might see a height and heightened activity level at first, sort of um, an extinction burst of um, hypervigilance or more activity than normal trying to change the environment. And then you might see reduced activity like uh, lethargic animals. You might see weight loss. You might see reduced appetite. You might see poor body condition. You might start seeing um, vomiting or like in snakes regurgitation. You might start seeing um, diarrhea. So there's going to be physiological and health changes, um, either a weight gain or a weight loss. You're going to start seeing things physically happen to that animal if they're experiencing chronic stress. And even things that you can't see, like um, it, it can affect the heart and the internal organs stress can. And we all know that because people who experience high uh, uh, chronic stress have a higher incidence of heart disease. And it's not going to be different with an animal, but that may be something as a keeper we might not see. So if you were, um, so there's a difference, like there's a, there. No, I'm, I'm hearing that there's a difference between an animal adjusting to a stressor, like you were talking about with building resiliency, yes. where they ex they kind of become accustomed or conditioned to the stressor and then no longer is it a stressor, they've acquiesced. And because then they're exhibiting the same behaviors that they did previous to the introduction of the stressor to an extent versus newer behaviors that might not be positive, like regurgitation and right. excess lethargy body condition. So there's, there's a difference between accepting the stressor and becoming chronically stressed visually That's, in a keeper. And behaviorally, and I'm sure physiologically too, but I can't measure, I'm not set up here to do blood draws and routine physiological checks, but behaviorally, there's a difference between seeing an animal exhibit some mild to moderate stress when they first are introduced to something novel or when so they don't have something they think they should have right then and where they then return to no stress in that comfort zone. So they're stretched a little bit outside of their comfort zone and they might do a lot of approach and retreat or a lot of, um, you know, maybe circle around into their hide, but they come right back out. So you're going to see that fluctuation between some some mild to moderate stress behaviors, but going back to being relaxed versus severe stress behaviors, which are going to be, I'm so out of my mind stressed. I can't think, I can't learn. I'm vomiting. I'm, ex I'm, you know, evacuating my bladder and bowels. I'm just over the top, severely stressed, and I'm not returning to my comfort zone. So those are differences. You are going to see some mild to moderate stress any with any change. And that's good as you're trying to build resiliency and trying to get them used to things. But that shouldn't tip over the edge to that severe stress. It should go back to, okay, yeah, I was a little bit stretched out of my comfort zone with that, but now I'm okay with it. And I Thank think you. that's such a good point. If you don't build that resi resiliency, by introducing smaller stressors, eventually something will happen that will push them right over the edge. It's the same as if you overparent a kid, you do everything for them, you protect them, and then they get a flat tire and they go off the wall. They can't handle it, right? It's a small problem for most people, but if you were there solving every problem for them, which brings us back to the greatest hole in the world, if you have theoretically solved every single problem that animal is going to have, no wonder it goes off food when you move it from one tub to another. You just did something that is so much more than it could ever handle that you've sent it over the rails. So mm -hmm. it's, I think that's a really good point.